From air pods filled with earwax to algae covered pools and air vents filled with dust, we follow the professionals to uncover the satisfying ins and outs of how some of the filthiest things are professionally deep cleaned. Our first expert is Julius from Phone Fixcraft. He shows us how dirty our phones can get and how he makes them look brand new. Hello, I'm Julius and I'm the owner of Phone Fix Craft. So today I'm going to show you how I clean and repair a damaged iPhone. <laughs> My job is actually phone repairs, including micro soldering and data recovery, stuff like that. And the cleaning is just, it's not that it's a huge part of our business. It's just fixed phones that we see that they need, they need some cleaning. So the first step, uh, you have to remove those two bottom screws which every iPhone has. We open up the screen. The phone had a broken screen and the, and the owner of this phone used, used it for a good while with that broken screen. So the, all the uh, internals of the phone were exposed to, to whatever was in customer's pocket. So uh, it's actually a fire hazard. So, so we try to remove every loose bit from, from the inside of the phone. But once it's loose, I would use compressed air like a, like a gun. The dirtiest parts would be the charging port uh, on, on all kinds of phones, not only iPhones. Uh, but actually it doesn't look dirty if you just look at it with naked eye. And uh, the microscope I have here is it's my most loved tool. It's gonna come, come with me when I die. I would just uh, clean every phone, every speaker, every earpiece and every charging port under this, uh, this microscope. This tool we use for charging port cleaning is something similar to a metal a toothpick. Uh, it's just a little bit thinner and then and, and sharper. So now I'm going to clean gears worth of pocket lint and dust from the charging port that experiencing charging issues. Charging ports would be usually filled with the uh, like pocket lint uh, from your <laughs> from your jeans and then whatever is in your pocket really. If you had a cookie there, the, you would have some crumbs or something like that. You can see, you know, what uh, what color uh, uh, threads, trousers or pants. I'm not sure in, in the United States, the trousers or pants. <laughs> so what you see here, it's actually the contents of uh, of a charging port of what we usually would find there. So it's. Uh, it's just a pocket lint, really. Pocket lint and, and dust. I would use the same tool that I use for cleaning charging ports to clean the uh, really heavy clogged speakers as well. We do get phones that are really dirty and messed up, but it's for us, it's just normal, you know. Medics are not, not surprised by injuries or something like that. It's their job, so so for us, it's, uh, yeah. So on this phone, the battery has already started to swell and, uh, and customer agreed uh, to get it replaced. We removed the battery. Uh, we attached the new pull tabs uh, to, to a new battery. We just need to apply a new uh, display adhesive before putting everything back together. So 
so once the screen is pressed back into the frame, uh, you just need to put the uh, last two screws in and it's, it's ready to be cleaned before giving it back to the customer. just have to solve solve a puzzle you know to get the thing working and this is especially rewarding if some uh, few other shops deemed it unfixable and then it comes to you and and you accept the challenge and you actually get that fixed it's uh, it's nice it's uh, th that's what i really love Can you hear that? Julius now shares how to bring clogged AirPods back to life. Today I'm gonna show you how to clean dirty AirPods from start to finish. We offer all kind of phone repairs. Uh, we specialize in iPhone repairs mainly Whatever is portable and smart, we can repair it. So when people bring in their AirPods, uh, the main problem they have is the low volume either on both or just on one side of the AirPods. Usually they come like in the condition that uh, customers are, are going to throw them away and they just come to me as a last resort. So I'm going to show you three different pairs of AirPods in three different conditions. This pair of AirPods, of course, they are not cleaned. Uh, of course, the main main brown thing is uh, is the airwax, and uh, it's a piece of bacon or sausage or or carrot. <laughs> nobody nobody really knows, but uh, I just uh, pour a drop of uh, pure alcohol and uh, leave them for a couple of seconds just to soak in, and uh, and I use toothpick to to kind of release the the whatever is in there, probably airwax or, or something like that. I softened that with, the, with this short brush. I just trimmed them down to, to make them harder. Then I just use vacuum cleaner to, to suck everything out. And then, and then repeat, repeat, repeat the same process again and again until it's uh, until it's clean. Really, there's uh, two sets of mesh on in every airport. There's the one, the steel one that you see in front, and there is one a little bit smaller pitch one behind it. So we can see the second clean, clean second mesh behind it in in those few open holes. The actual mesh is, is pretty clean. Most of the holes are still open, and uh, so this pair actually looks very bad, but it's still quite loud and, and usable. Yeah, this look at the wars. These airports, they were still working. You can see, you can see some uh, open holes there. So the, the sound was still coming through. It was super, super quiet, but it was still coming through. That one open uh, open hole in that mesh, it's, it, it makes a difference, really. It looks like they were lying around for, for a good while somewhere, you know, in the corner, because uh, it like, looks like mold or something like that. It's, yeah, they, they were not the cleanest ones, that's for sure. You can see it's seen some better days. You can see the actual plastic. It was probably uh, chewed with, by, you know, a small dog or cat or, <laughs> or something like that, you know, because the plastic itself, like, I, you never, or maybe, or maybe it was chewed by the owner themselves, you know, like, uh, <laughs> visually, the, the left, left one might look much worse than the right one. And uh, it's just a matter of how many, the, how many of those uh, holes in the net are still open. You can see the dark, uh, dark holes, you know, where, where it means that there's nothing behind them, that they are not clogged. So they are, they are open, sound can still go through them. And, uh, you, you know, usually if they're still, like in, in this one, probably there's like 20% of, of holes are still, still open.
I believe the customer tried to clean them by themselves and they did their best. So if you zoom in, you can see the actual, the, every single hole on that net is clogged. You can see something there, you know. On the last pair of ones I was using uh, Mr. Muscle. Window and glass, streak free shine. Every single one is clogged, so I believe that like this is completely silent, so it wasn't usable, that's for sure. So when the airport is, uh, is clean and uh, the, the mesh of the speaker, it, it looks like nice, nice dark gray color and you can actually see well, th through the holes, you can see some, you know, the dark black, you know, the inside of the, of the airport. The volume is back, it's loud and clear and uh, they're usable again. Uh, I don't want to look like the, um, the pro of the pros of the airport's cleaning. I just uh, I would like to find a solution that, uh, you know, maybe even the DIY solution work, you know, and keep them clean and tidy and loud. When was the last time that you went to the dentist? Dental hygienist Faye Donald proves that teeth cleanings are nothing to be afraid of. Today I'm going to show you how guided biofilm therapy or GBT works when we professionally clean a patient's mouth from start to finish. My job as a dental hygienist is to detect and treat, but most importantly, prevent periodontal disease. Biofilms are highly organised microscopic communities of bacteria, um, but it's responsible for bleeding gums, for bad breath, for some dental infections, for some of the insightly deposits that we see on our teeth. And, and of course, it's linked to some more serious systemic diseases as well. So here we can see plaque um, and calculus deposits, but, but more concerning is the colour of the gums, which are red and, and they're also puffy and swollen. And that would lead us to believe either gingivitis or even periodontal disease could be present here. One of the problems with biofilm is that you can't see it and you can't feel it. So I use a dye called Biofilm Discloser, which is an organic coloured dye. So when the dye is applied to the teeth, which have biofilm on them, it changes the colour of the biofilm. Um, it's a really clever two-tone dye, so it means that it stains um, early biofilm, which is less than three days old pink, and it stains mature biofilm, which is more than three days old blue. The patient is shown in the mirror the stained biofilm, biofilms are microscopic, whereas the plaque is a biofilm that's matured and it's large enough to be seen with the naked eye. Ideally, what we want is to disrupt dental biofilm before it has the chance to mature into plaque. So this is where we start the, the cleaning process and it is completely different to the old fashioned methods of, of curatage and hand scaling. So here I'm using a tool called Airflow Max, which acts like a warm jet wash for inside the mouth. Um, it uses a combination of warm water and tiny soluble and antimicrobial powder. Airflow Max will remove 100% of the biofilm from the teeth and all of the surrounding tissues, including underneath the gums where it's dark and warm and the biofilm really likes to hide. I'm, I'm also using the Airflow Max not just to take the biofilm away, but it, it takes the stains away as well. So the mouth looks and feels super clean afterwards. It's very comfortable for the patient. It's gentle, it's efficient, it's very safe with no abrasion or damage to the tooth surface at all.
after we've disrupted all of the biofilm and we've removed all of the stains. Uh, PAs on no pain is, um, is used at this stage. Um, and it uses ultrasonic vibrations to remove any remaining hard calculus. It shaves the calculus off very gently. So it's very different to the old fashioned methods of scraping the teeth, which would take calculus away, but would also scratch the tooth surface. of the GBT process um, is, is our quality control stage really. So here I would spend a few moments checking around the whole mouth to ensure that all the deposits have been removed and all the biofilms been disrupted. Um, so at this stage I would hand the mirror back to my patients so they can see the before and after results of their guided biofilm therapy treatment. I usually ask my patients to run their tongue over the teeth at this stage to feel how silky smooth they are um, now that the biofilm and, and calculus has gone. So learning good oral hygiene habits um, is like learning to swim. You have to be shown. Um, so ask your dental hygienist to teach you how to clean your teeth properly. Spend the most time and concentrate the most efforts on the areas that you can't see. That's where you'll find the most biofilm. So in between the back teeth, underneath the gum line, around the base of restorations. Oh, oh I love my job. I love it so much uh, because I get to put smiles on people's faces every single day. What other job in the world gets to do that? Next, Miles Laughlin transforms this murky green pool back into clean, clear waters. Hi, I'm Miles, and I'm gonna show you how I professionally clean the pool from start to finish. This pool's not looking too good. I'm gonna get the submersible pump out straight away, pump the water out, and then come back the next day. So here we are the next day. It's empty, but there's like a blanket of algae all over the pool. I'm going to shovel it all up, put it in buckets. Basically the green sludge is after a pool's been left for a long time without any chlorine or any sanitizer in the pool, you'll, you'll get algae build up. Most of them don't smell that bad, but when, it's, when, when the sludge is really thick on the bottom and you like disturb it, because obviously it's not been disturbed for a long time, the smell that comes out is crazy. Basically, when we had the pool empty, we realised how many frogs there were. I'd never seen so many frogs in a pool before in my life. Uh, like every scoop, every shovel full, there was maybe one or two frogs on, on it. So we had to get them out, put them on the side of the pool and let them run off into the bushes. Uh, so we used hydrochloric acid uh, mixed with water, so it was diluted down. Get out the old Karcher K4, start pressure washing the pool down. It's all coming up pretty well. At the bottom of the pool, there's a main drain. Um, There'd been some work done around the pool, like the slabbing and that. Um, obviously, there's a lot of leaves gone into the pool, so a lot of muck at the bottom and just built up and solidified so that had to be broken up. Nothing special, it was just a screw, like an old screwdriver from the van. Uh, helped to get into it, break it up, um, and then hoovered out.
the dirtiest parts on the pool are going to be the filters. Cause basically, they have the water runs through the filters continuously or on a timer. The blue tank is the filter with sand in. And that keeps the pool water clean. What it does is catches all the dirt and the stuff that's floating around in the pool. So that's helped. And then once a week, once every two weeks, whenever I go and do a maintenance, you do a backwash and that gets rid of all the dirt and anything that's been floating around in the pool. New sand in, cut it open. Got to do five bags of sand for this 24 inch filter. Slip the lid back on. So when I do the chemicals, and they all look the same, chlorine as well, they're all just like sort of white powder. But basically, I'm just balancing the chemicals on the on the swimming pools when I'm doing the maintenance. A few bags of salt needed. Three twenty-five kilo bags. Basically, what happens when you pour it in goes through the system and runs through a salt cell, which is just a chlorine generator. So as it's running through the salt cell, it uses a process called electrolysis. I think I said it right. Basically just turning it into chlorine for the pool. Get a brush out, brush it all around so it's not just sitting on the floor. And that's that job done. Um, this was definitely the worst pool I've worked on in terms of how dirty it was and how much algae there was and the smell the smell was just ridiculous it was unbearable at some some sometimes it didn't take me all day it didn't take too long i know it looks like a lot of mess but it went pretty well a lot of people say to me you know don't you ever just feel like just jumping in the pool i mean on a really hot day i do but other than that i'm not really that bothered about it Miles now revives a hot tub that is perfect for a spa day. Today I'm going to show you how to professionally clean a hot tub. Alright, this is probably the worst hot tub I've had to work on. There's literally slugs, spiders, the water's black and the smell is just disgusting. first thing I'd done when I got there was taking the cover off for the actual job was yeah to take the cover off inspect it see how bad it was and we took that off and stood it up on the grass and that got jet washed um, and brushed down and there's a lot of like creases in the cover so there's slugs in there as well still trying to hide and like sort of stay in their home but they all got cleared out so it was mostly water with the jet wash um, and then you had like a little bit of um, cleaning solution uh, with the cover, that took around an hour to clean. On the side, there's a lot of like black markings, like slime and dirt, and there's still a lot of slugs sort of like um, slivering around, like a hundred slugs on this hot tub. And it, uh, the guy said he hadn't used it for like 10 years. So I just started off with a jet wash and they sort of got jet washed away at first. There was like so many and I'm, to be honest with you, I don't really fancy picking up slugs, so. So the white tube there, that's connected to my submersible pump, which I'm using to pump water from the hot tub down the drain. Uh, so I've got the broom out because um, you've got where where you sit down in the hot tub is quite it's, it's a bit like a bowl, so it'll hold a lot of water. And what I'm just doing is just pushing it into the middle, so the yeah the submersible pump can drain it out easier. At the bottom of the tub, you just had like a little bit of dirty water and a little bit of grit. It's 
So underneath here, you've got the main circulating pump. You've got the heater for the hot tub. All the pump equipment's kept underneath the hot tub. So I pulled the panel back, and which all needed to be cleaned out as well. And I used the Hoover to get all that. So hot tub flush is a chemical which you will pour into your in through the where the filters usually sit and then you turn on all the all the jets in the hot tub so yeah once you put the hot tub flush in and it starts reacting with all like the um fats and everything that's caught up in the in the tubes inside the hot tub it creates like a foam and then you can also see in the foam you can see the dirt which is coming out of the, the pipes as well so you can see it's working. Once it bubbles up, you can um, get a net and just net them out so they don't, because what happens is it will start sticking to the sides because it's like an acrylic um, material. So it will stick to the sides. Um, and if you don't scoop it out, you'll have to then scrub the sides again. Um, so it's just easier just to get the net net out the foamy bits and all the dirt on the foam um, and it'll make it easier for yourself. Um, so I've got this hot tub fil uh, filter here and it's looking really black. There's a lot of dirt all over it and I'm going to give it a rinse down just to clear it so it's filtering properly again. Most pools have sand filters whereas hot tubs have cartridge filters. So what happens is obviously while the filters are collecting the small particles, if you don't take them out and rinse them, your water will start to go cloudy. Uh, so it's basically just dirt and then obviously anything that comes off like your body, um, like dead skin, anything can get caught up in the filter as well. So you can rinse them down with your garden hose and then you can spray them with um, filter cleaner, which just disinfects any bacteria that's on them. Um, and then put them straight back into the hot tub and then they're ready to go again. On hot tub you can get like a little floating dispenser um, and it just floats around on the water just slowly releasing chlorine or bromine. Uh, that's a chemical test kit um, and on the left will be to test for the bromine or chlorine level and on the right I am testing for the pH level. You're looking for the middle colour which is around 7.2. So with the hot tub it was looking, after I'd finished with it, it was looking brand new, nice and blue again. Um, the customer was really happy with it. and. It just looked like a new hot tub rather than what it did like five hours ago. That was definitely the worst hot tub I've ever worked on. And actually seeing the final product um, with it nice and blue, water in it again, nice and clear and everything working on there. I was pretty happy with that. For his last trick, witness Miles as he takes this pool from green to clean. Today I'm going to show you a few different pools and how I clean the bottom of the pool. Grandma's pool definitely was the most challenging. Um, the sludge on the bottom, it was like six inches of sludge like across the whole pool. It looked very abandoned because obviously it had been left for 15 years. So that was like when I first got into the pool, obviously there was a lot of the water had been drained down quite a lot there but as I stepped in it was really soft branches may have fell off of like the the bushes that are around the pool um, and then just sort of like they could have started growing like bigger as well while they were in the pool as well so so we had to shovel it into sort of buckets and then, and then someone would put it in a wheelbarrow and then take it down to the heap at the end of the garden and it just created like a massive pile of just sludge I'd say there was probably like a ton or uh, maybe two tons of sludge um so yeah get like draining that down and uh like scooping all the sludge out of that one and just the time it took um yeah that was definitely the the hardest one but uh we got there in the end Oh my 
God. So recently I've been to a job um, and the pool has been left for like eight years. But the water weirdly was like clear, but the algae in there was really like blanket like and there was loads of it. And you could see like a move it around. You can see it looked like really weird, like an underwater sort of like forest of like algae. It was like really bad. Um, and that pool definitely had to be um, drained down. Okay, so when I first go to a pool and I see that it's green, what I'll do first is get um, a pool brush out and then I'll brush the whole pool, all the surfaces, disturbing all the algae off the surface. Normally, algae will just like break up. Like you put chemicals in and you brush the, the pool um, and it will just break up into like really small particles and then you can just like hoover it. But like, this type of algae was just like really like stringy and just like solid together. Um, yeah, it was a weird one. Um, and then again, there's like sludge on the floor. We're sort of just like brushing the sludge to like a pile and then like scooping it out. That pool had been left just sort of like gone a couple of days without chlorine. And because it was sort of like indoor, it had like it's sort of like in a greenhouse type. So it got like really hot in there when the sun comes out. And just the algae just attached itself to the tiles like so badly. It looked like it had been left for like years. Then I got the, the hose and started watering it down. It all cleaned off, come up nice and blue and then rinsed it down and that literally took like 15 minutes. The woman who owned the pool, she didn't, she only called us to come and open the pool in, in like August. Had like the whole summer just sitting there doing nothing. So like we took the, the cover off and there was like mosquito larvae in the pool and there was mosquitoes like flying everywhere. Literally so bad I had to like run away from the pool and she actually didn't want this pool emptied. She just wanted to try and get it around with like chemicals. Get some chemicals out, shock and chlorine granules we used on this one. So like when I shock a pool, that basically kills off all the algae and all the contaminants in the pool. Basically what it does is combine all the small particles and what it relies on is like no movement in the water. So it's combining all the particles and then they become like heavy and then they just sink to the bottom. Yeah, after a few days, come back and it was like, uh, the water was crystal clear, just all the debris and everything was just on the bottom when I came in and like just hoovered it up and it was just crystal clear, ready to go sort of thing. So if you've got an outdoor pool, you're going to want to maintain it like once a week at least. No, so I get a lot of people do say to me, why don't you drain the pool before winter? But what it is, is you've got to um, take into consideration like the structure of the pool. So if you have no water in there, if there's water in the ground surrounding the pool, it can pressurise the walls and then cause damage. But you have to keep water in the pool. Um, what you do have to do is check your pool at least like once a month and add the correct chemicals and then when you come to open it in summer it's going to be nice and clear still. Your allergies will thank you after 47 years of dust is cleaned out of this vent. Today I'm going to show you how I clean 47 years of dust out of vents. As soon as we walked in, we see the old vents, the furnace, how old it was. Before even opening any of the vents up, I knew how bad it was going to be. You know, he said 47 years of dust, probably over 100 years, to be honest. If you look at a vent and you see dust on the actual vent, that's a clear sign that the ducts have probably never been cleaned and they're pretty filthy inside. Uh, we like to start on the very top of the house and work our way down. 
that tool that we're using, uh, we call it whiskers. Um, the whiskers are just made out of rubber. The end of it's attached to an air compressor and you have air just coming out through the rod out the little whisker things. So what you're looking at right now is just me pulling chunks of dust out that have probably been in there for over 100 years. There was too much dust to be putting it in the vacuum. Um, so I literally went in there with my hands and grabbed probably like five pounds of dust. Isn't it gnarly? Like, look at how much dust that is. It's just so sick, honestly. This is the back of the dryer, uh, and you guys can pretty much see there's an endless amount of lint coming out. There's a few reasons why you should get your dryer vent cleaned. It's a huge fire hazard, and your clothes will dry more efficiently. It's well worth the money to just pay to get it cleaned every year. vacuum is on throughout the whole process uh, and what we're doing is blowing all that dust and debris closer and closer to the vacuum. This house in particular had 18 vents. Most of the time, I think probably 75% of the time, the houses that we go to have never been cleaned. Um, people just don't think about it, you know, that getting your air ducts clean isn't like a regular thought that comes to your, you know, head. The dust you typically see in your vents is, most of it is actually uh, human skin cells. Yeah, it's pretty gnarly. So right now we're done and everything's pretty much good to go. Um, you're pretty much going to see a brand new home, honestly. Uh, you're gonna feel much better. Uh, your health is gonna be better. I actually got a phone call after that job and they said all, all their allergies went away. It, it's just a huge health benefit, honestly. Uh, you might not notice like the small stuff, but your body does. Clogged gutters can wreak havoc on a home, but the gutter guys can clear them out with ease. I'm Broden and I own a business in Connecticut called the Gutter Guys. Today I'm going to show you how to clean gutters with wet and dry debris. So when we clean a gutter with wet debris, nine times out of 10, we want to clean it by hand. The reason why is when it's wet, it typically is very muddy and there's a lot of what we call shingle dust or grit in the gutters and it's literally a mud. And when we blow them, when they are wet, it makes a muddy mess all over the house. We want to clean them by hand for that reason. So that is a gutter that is completely jammed with leaves and debris and the downspout was completely covered. When we released the debris out of the downspout and got that gutter cleaned, all of that rainwater that was in the gutter just started to flow very heavily right down the downspout, as it should. So oftentimes when we do a gutter cleaning, not only do we find leaves, but we find plants so big that we actually call them trees sometimes growing right out of a gutter. We're actually pulling out a big plant and you can see the whole root system come right out with it. Certain types of trees give off these little things that come off the tree and will grow another tree. And when those land in the gutter, it's a perfect environment for that to grow. It's a classic sign that your gutters have not been cleaned in years. It also puts a significant amount of weight from the whole root system growing in the gutter on the gutter which in turn will pull that gutter off of the fascia board, which is actually the board behind the gutter that the gutter is mounted to. 
Wet debris is usually just saturated with water. Water will overflow at the gutter and get into your basement and create cracks in your foundation. Once water does find its way into your basement, it wreaks havoc. Here, the water that's flowing out of the downspout at the bottom is the end result that we are looking for. So that water will flow down and out as it properly should. When we see dry debris, the reason why that debris is dry is because there has not been any rain in the past, I would say, week or so. So when we clean a gutter that has dry debris, oftentimes we will use a hand blower and blow those gutters out because it does a really good job of just getting everything out of the gutter, whether it be leaves or sticks or, or curly stuff that comes off in the spring. Depending on the pitch of the roof, we will get on that roof, start our hand blower and walk across that roof line, hand blowing out all of the debris out of that gutter. Sometimes the debris is very compact and it's thick. That's a classic sign of maybe a couple of years that somebody had not had their gutters cleaned. We stick to one type of ladder and that's an aluminum ladder. The aluminum ladder does conduct electricity, so it's very important we stay away from power lines when we are moving aluminum ladders. We could get severely electrocuted, but it's certainly deadly, which is why we mark the power line areas with flags before we start a gutter cleaning, because you're looking where you're walking, so you don't look up to see the power lines. So it's very important for us to have a reminder that power lines are there. We will often drop a penny down the downspout just to know that that downspout's free and clear because we can see and hear it go all the way through and back out at the bottom. And we know that we're in good shape. The best advice I can give a homeowner is to be proactive and not reactive. Typically when you're reactive, it's too late. Damage has been done. The water may already be in your basement. It may already be in your home. And it's just not a good way to maintain your house. Water is seriously detrimental to your house and the main cause of water is from your gutters. So if you keep the gutters free and clear and you do consistent cleaning, whether it be two or three times per year, which we recommend, you will never have any issues with water in your basement or ruining your flower beds or rotting out the fascia and soffits of your home. Just stay on top of gutter cleaning. Step up your spring cleaning with AJ as he pressure washes years of dirt. My name is AJ Joyner, owner of Advanced Pressure Washing LLC. Today we're going to show you how we clean the exterior of a client's dirty home step by step. We, in general, we offer exterior cleaning, but the main services in the residential field are house washing, gutter clean out, uh, concrete cleaning. Those are the main ticket items that we solicit to the residential clients. The condition of the fence structurally is great, but as you can see, it's covered in mildew and algae. Wood is very particular because if you uh, use too much pressure, they're gonna cause a lot of damage to the surface. So to treat it, we just use water. We actually use moderate pressure. And we make sure always to go with the grain. This keeps us from furring slash damaging the wood. The driveway is terrible, covered in mildew and algae. The chemicals we normally use is called sodium hypochlorite, 12.5%, or better known as pool shock slash industrial bleach. Uh, we normally do that down to a 50-50 ratio in our buckets. This kills the mildew and algae, that top layer when we pre-treat, it kills it almost instantly. This is called a Whisper Wash Big Boy Surface Cleaner. That metal tubing uh, actually rotates a round on a swivel. That's the item that, that I use to actually clean concrete. The 
from there, we'll actually go around washing the trim of, around the brick and other areas the surface cleaner couldn't reach. Uh, and then we will post treat with the detergent again to get any organic stains that are left behind. Uh, after we do the driveway, we'll then do the uh, front patio and sidewalk. Uh, also, sometimes if the client wants, we'll also do the curbs along the drive. The house is in pretty good condition, but there was a few spots that we noticed that were pretty bad with heavy and thick mildew and algae. Uh, on a house, we use roughly about 10% sodium hypochlorite uh, mixed with about 90% water. So the black on the brick is actually mildew, just really thick mildew and algae. Uh, this is caused by moisture uh, and shade, allowing for such thick mildew and algae to grow. When we wash the house's exterior, we wash the roof, the outside, the gutters, the side of the home, the windows, the doors, anything that is on the side or attached to the home itself. So we're finished. We finally got the job done. Uh, so roughly this job took us about uh, four and a half hours. Everything looks amazing. The client was beyond happy with the job that we have done. You can clearly see everything is transformed into a new clean state. My personal suggestion, instead of trying to do it yourself, is to always hire a professional because you're dealing with some very strong and dangerous chemicals uh, and it can become dangerous when in the hands of someone not experience. Sleep peacefully as John from Superfresh takes years off of this mattress's life. My name is John Bristol and I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. I'm the director of Superfresh and today I'm going to show you how we clean the very dirty mattresses as well as the average dirty ones. So the typical process of cleaning a mattress is we spray on an enzyme-based cleaner and that will break down the dirt and the body oils and you know the little incidents and we give that chemical some time to work. After that there's some agitation, also known as scrubbing. And in the final stage of the process we use the extractor and that would spray in a solution of clean water, fabric shampoo and deodorizer and vacuum at the same time. So it rinses away everything so there isn't any Harsh chemicals left to interfere with anyone's skin or anything afterwards. There's going to be a lot of dust build up over time, and um, there's going to be hair. If there are a lot of kids in your home, you're going to, you're going to find urine, even if the client doesn't know. Sometimes, like you know, some people eat on their beds and stuff, so you find crumbs from various food stuff. Alright, so I actually had no idea what to expect when coming to do this job and I'm still not entirely sure what caused it. It may have been some flooding in the area, but I'm not sure. So that was probably more than five years for sure. So right here I am spraying on the enzyme-based cleaner onto the mattress and I'm looking to see the areas where I may have to apply another coat as we go along. What I use right now, it's a synthetic enzyme. I could use it for everything, but there are some stains that would require like additional chemicals if you really want to get them removed visually. But the most important thing for most clients is getting the actual thing that caused the stain out. So we say there may not be a visual improvement, but you can be sure that you're getting all the nasties out. They are usually just regular buildup, so just regular dust and dirt that accumulate over the years. Some clients don't use like a full three-piece sheet set. A lot of clients don't have mattress protectors either. 
Using heat is beneficial because heat acts almost like a universal catalyst. So heat would help your chemicals to work faster, so it would help the enzyme cleaner to break down the stuff faster, and it would also help the fabric shampoo to latch onto the dirt particles faster. So it helps make the cleaning process more efficient. Unfortunately, there's no way to know for sure that you get like a hundred percent of it, but you want to know that you're picking up as much as possible. This mattress was especially dirty, so it's either like a lot of years, probably more than seven or so, or a lot of use. But I don't think it's any one thing, but just like a combination of factors that leads it to be that condition. I found that you could use a variable speed polisher and a scrubbing brush attachment. The brush is rotating at about 600 RPM. Um, we use the softest brush available because some fabrics are really delicate. And we use that to help break down the larger debris and stuff on the surface of the fabric. So it helps break down the larger pieces of debris because you know, sometimes they have build up that is really, really bad and it's actually like caked up. The general process for removing stains is just to yeah, isolate where the stain is and I may double apply the enzyme based cleaner to it or I may spend a little longer scrubbing it. I believe for this when the client told us it was probably about two years and it wasn't too bad it was just like a light a creamish color but we know the original color was white and so we sprayed it one time and we did the scrubbing i mean you'll always have the extremes some would be much much darker brown some would be much more spotty but the average person is you know just a little cream just a little off-white <laughs> from where it should be for mattresses, you're usually going to get those kind of colors because even below the surface, you still have a lot of debris. Your dead skin cells, your dirt and your dust building up. So even if the top surface doesn't accurately represent what is hidden inside there, you're going to find it once we do the extraction. After a certain amount of years, your mattress significantly increases in weight simply due to like the dust and dead skin cells that collect. So one is going to be more uncomfortable, two if you're using it regularly, some of that is going to be entering the air. So you're going to have like a lower quality air inside the home. It may attract mites if there's a, a lot of moisture around. Just overall it's not going to be the best for your well-being. Like for people that are asthmatic, the buildup of dust could be a problem. For people with sensitive skin, the, any buildup on the mattress over time could pose a threat in the future in terms of like having flare-ups. If you're taking all the preventative measures, I don't think you should need the service more than like once a year. Get it cleaned and then get a mattress protector because you can always wash that every fortnight or every month and you're in a much better position than paying me. I, mean, I don't mind, <laughs> but you're in a much better position for your own well-being. Jay from Kleenex takes us behind the scenes of reviving a restaurant's greasy exhaust system. My name is Jay Lopez and I'm the owner of Kleenex. Today, I'm going to be walking you through how we clean a kitchen exhaust system in a restaurant. The purpose of a kitchen exhaust system is to extract the fumes from a kitchen in a commercial setting. In order to remove grease, you have to understand grease. What holds the oil together is the fat. And once the first layer is up, it becomes a magnet and it attracts more and more and more. Everything is clean from top to bottom. You would start cleaning the fan first. We're using a high-end degreaser with a little potassium hydroxide and sodium hydroxide. Those two chemicals combined create miracles in destroying the fat and the grease. In our case, we time it somewhere between 10 to 15 minutes. Once we see that the grease starts to melt, at that point, we know we need to apply hot water and remove it. Because anything longer at that point is gonna to start to destroy the metal. Once the fan has been cleaned, the next step would be the duct. That's the part that connects the fan to the hood. This level is considered extreme. That was a fire waiting to happen. I would say this is about a year worth of grease. It all depends on the volume of cooking. If this is a moderate cooking, this is about a year's worth of grease. That's a lot. The duct is clean in a few different steps. 
During this process, we use a tool made by Guardian. This tool is known as the Easy Magnetic Duct Scraper. It has magnets set into the tool and a razor blade on each side. Once it's clinched to the dock, it is manually moved forward and backwards until the grease is removed. This forward and backward method assures that the grease buildup will be removed from both sides. It'll go from the yellow color all the way into the black. When it's in the black level, that's an extreme level. That means that the system has not been properly maintained. And these types of designs will use duct spinners and duct brushes. The duct spinner is designed to self-rotate within a protective cage and spray water at high speed, which dislodge buildup from the metal duct. We use a combination of a foaming agent and a degreaser. The foam is used as a delivering agent and it allows the degreaser to stay in contact with the grease for a longer period. If foam was not used, the degreaser would drip off the grease. The next step would be the hood and the filters. See, the filters are your first line of defense. What the filters is doing is holding back heat and it's holding back most of that grease. When the filters no longer can hold the grease, and once that grease starts getting heat and melting, you have the potential of that grease dropping into your food. And at that point, it's a health issue. I've seen restaurants been shut down by the health department for not cleaning their hood. I've seen restaurants been shut down by the fire marshal for not maintaining their hoods. We take precaution in protecting the area from contamination. We use two layers of plastic sheeting in order to protect the appliances from coming in contact with any chemical. The second layer of plastic sheeting is wrapped around the hood and then a funnel is created. The funnel is used to drain the chemical, grease, and water into the plastic containers. The plastic sheeting also serves as a protective barrier in preventing the chemical from coming in contact with the food preparation area. Once we're completed and the plastic sheeting is removed, we'll conduct a fresh water wipe down and recommend to the client that they do the same prior to preparing any food. According to NFPA 96, which is the agency that regulates this industry, the frequency of cleanings depends on the style of cooking you're conducting and the frequency of cooking. For example, if you cook with solid fuel, solid fuel is basically cooking with charcoal. Those are 30-day mandatory cleanings because they produce a lot more grease and the ambers that come from the silent fuel can ignite the grease. If you're an occasional cooking facility, those would be a year.